Hi, welcome back to the first law of thermodynamics and gas behavior in physical chemistry. My name is Kevin Pilkoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about how the distance between two charged species relates to the potential energy between them. And this also relates to um, how the ideal gas equation is derived, ultimately some of the assumptions that go into that. And then also, how do we differentiate between ideal gas behavior and real gas behavior? Because ideal gas behavior does not account for things like repulsions and attractions, but in real life, any gas is not ideal to some extent, and some of them are more real than others for having attractions and repulsions. So we're going to look over here at this diagram in just a minute, but I want to get some um, physical concepts out of the way first. So if I have two charged species, so I, the charged species could be atoms, basically, they each have charges associated with them, protons and electrons. Anytime I have a, two charged species of any kind separated by a distance, R, a voltage develops. And all voltage is, basically, is it's a measure of the tendency of any, it's a relative measure of any, of a, a charged species to move towards or away from another charged species, okay? And voltage of some charge one is given by Coulomb's constant times charge one divided by the distance between charge one and whatever the second charged species is. If I do take that voltage of charge one and multiply times charge two, this ultimately becomes the potential energy between charges one and two. And ultimately, when you have a positive potential energy, that usually means that you have net repulsions. Potential energy is a state of a system that the system doesn't like to be in. Okay, There's a tendency, a spontaneous tendency, for potential energy to be converted into kinetic energy. For example, if you were to hold, say, a book, um, in your hand, maybe a meter off the ground, and you're just holding it static, we obviously know there's gravitational potential energy. And the only thing that's keeping the book up is holding it there with your hand. If you let the book go, we know that spontaneously all of the potential energy gets converted into kinetic and it falls towards the ground. Okay, So potential energy is sort of a higher energy state of the system. It doesn't like to be like that. Okay, If you have negative potential energy, that usually results from these charges, Q1 and Q2 being opposite signs. That's an attractive type of force. And negative potential energy values usually indicate uh, favorable interactions like attractions. Okay, Now, delta U from a classical physics perspective is usually what we call potential energy. However, we know so far in physical chemistry that delta U is what we call internal energy. And so usually to distinguish potential energy from internal energy, the quantum mechanical term for potential energy is usually this delta V. So V is what we replace for potential energy to distinguish it from uh, internal energy. And the potential energy is always a function of the radius, which is the distance between any two charged species. All right. So what I have here is a potential energy diagram for two charged species. All right. Here, the way I'm going to think about this is this yellow sphere right here, this yellow atom is charged, and I'm going to essentially hold it fixed. I'm not going to allow this atom to move. It's going to stay where it is forever. This on the right here, this is another atom. This is a purple one, another charged species. And what I'm essentially going to do is I'm going to start with it a very large distance away from the yellow fixed atom. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly but surely move the purple atom to the left over towards the yellow atom. And so what I'm essentially going to do is as it moves towards the left towards this other atom, I'm just going to measure and record the potential energy in graphical form as it goes. All right. Now one thing to realize is essentially when I'm looking at this horizontal line right here, where it crosses this vertical axis, that's essentially where the potential energy is equal to zero. Okay, there's no um, there's no favorability um, whether it's repulsions or attractions. They're balanced at that point. Okay, now essentially, if you think about this purple atom being sort of an infinite distance away from the yellow atom, you can imagine based on electrostatics that there's really going to be negligible or no interactions between these two atoms, the yellow and the purple one, because the two atoms are an infinite distance away from each other. So that reality is indicated by this first limit right here. In other words, if I measure the potential energy 
where I take the limit of it, as the radius goes out here to the right to infinity, the potential energy will be zero. And that's just because if I go over here to this potential energy equation, if this r goes to infinity, well then you're taking some constant number over infinity, and that's zero. Okay, so there's no potential energy as this radius goes to infinity. But there always will be some negligible amount because you can never actually hit a potential energy of zero. Okay, you can approach it because it's a limit. Okay, this is sort of, you could think of it like a hyperbolic curve going to the right. All right, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to take it from infinity and move this purple sphere closer and closer to the yellow atom. So there's a point here called R trans, and all that means is to the right of this over here, when I have the purple atom a pretty large distance away from the yellow atom, that's where my gases behave ideally. Why? Because when do I have atoms that are far distant, high distances away from each other? Well, it's usually when I have high volume containers. It's when I have very low pressures. Remember, the, uh, the limit of pressure going to zero is when you have ideality, and that also occurs when the volume is really high, okay? And also, you tend to have a low number of moles of gas. If you have lower number of molecules overall, then they'll have a smaller distance, or excuse me, a larger distance between them. And so to the right of this R trans, okay, this vertical line, that's where gases behave ideally. And in general, we're considering they have no interactions with each other. But in reality, we know that's not the case. There are always interactions. And the closer these atoms get to each other, the more interactions they have. So let's bring them closer together. Well, notice what's happening. As I bring these atoms closer together, look what's happening to this red curve. It's going more and more into the negative potential energy side. Well, going back to this equation over here, what is negative potential energy? Well, when can it be negative? Can R be negative? No, radius can never be negative in this case. Coulomb's constant is about 9 times 10 to the 9th. That's always positive as a constant. But what if Q1, say, was negative and Q2 was positive? In other words, these are oppositely charged. One of them's maybe positively charged, one's negative. Well, then you have a net repulse, you have a net attraction because they're of opposite sign. And that's ultimately what can give a, you a negative value of potential energy. So this is where you have negative potential energy. And if you have neg if you have attractions, okay, that's if you have attractions, that's one of the things that violates the ideal gas derivation. And so that's when you have a real gas. So when you have real gases, you can have both attractions or repulsions. Now notice here we get more and more and more attractions because the potential energy is becoming more and more negative. Okay, so we're continuing to bring these atoms closer and closer to each other. Now, what will end up happening is you'll essentially bring them close enough to get to a point, and that's right here, right there. In fact, let me do that in this color. You'll get right here. This is actually described by this limit right here. Okay. It's, so it's the limit when the derivative of the potential energy with respect to the radius is equal to zero. In other words, what that means essentially just means the rate of change is zero, so the slope is zero. It's, it's just flat. The slope is flat, zero. Okay, what does that mean? Well, when you get to this point right here, it means essentially that to the right of this uh, blue line, there's net attractions, but if you go past this point, to the, to the left, it's going to be repulsions, okay? So essentially, we're kind of happy on this side with attractions, but now we're getting super, super, the atoms super, super close to one another. And eventually they become so close that at this point where the derivative of the potential energy with respect to R is zero, you have exactly the attractions balancing out the repulsions. And that's why the derivative is zero. It's, the slope is flat, okay? It's a horizontal line. So right here at R, the potential energy is a min, that's when you have repulsions balancing attractions. And that's why the absolute potential energy is a minimum, okay? It's because now we're, we've, we've continued to get them closer together where we have a more and more attraction, but now the repulsions are getting high enough to where they completely balance out the attractions. And so if we get them closer together than this, in other words, going to the left on this curve, then now the repulsions are going to become greater than attractions. Okay, so essentially in this area right here where I have attractions, we'll say attractions are greater than the repulsions. But if I go to the left of this, uh, this vertical blue line, 
this is where the repulsions are actually greater than the attractions, okay? And at, right at this um, R potential min, where the derivative is zero, that's where repulsions are actually equal to attractions, or exactly equal. But if I continue to bring the atoms closer and closer to one another, I get more and more repulsions. And you can hopefully see that the repulsions are actually increasing very quickly, okay? And another thing also, notice that as I go farther and farther to the left, as I go to R, this essentially R equals zero, this, this curve is gonna blow up and potentially go to infinity. So that's actually described by this final limit. It's that if I take the limit of the potential energy as the radius goes to zero, the potential energy diverges, it becomes infinite, okay? This is why you can never have two atoms on top of one another unless they do some kind of nuclear reaction and fuse, but that's a completely different story. So what's the, what's the idea here? Well, the idea here is that when you have really high volume, low pressure, in fact, the limit of the pressure as it goes to zero, and low moles, these are three assumptions that ultimately go into kinetic molecular theory, and that allows you to derive the ideal gas equation of state, which is just P is equal to nRT over V. And those are assumptions you make. And as you get the atoms farther and farther apart, any interactions become so negligible that you really don't even consider them. Thus, it's ideal, no interactions. But as soon as you get the atoms close enough, so anything to the left of this vertical white line, then you have interactions. And you begin with attractions, and you bring them close enough to, to each other, and you finally get repulsions, okay? So, and also the other thing, this curve it's going to follow the same profile, however, the exact slope and, and distance between this point and this point and this point and this point can vary depending on the nature of the molecule. For example, if you have water vapor, water hydrogen bonds, so that means the attractive component right here can be very different than the repulsion as shown right here. Or if you have, if you were to somehow get uh, gaseous um, tert but tert butane, Okay, gaseous tert butane has a bunch of steric hindrance, and you can have a lot more repulsions there because there's a bunch of methyl groups sticking out. Okay, so this curve can vary in the slope and so forth, but the actual profile of it, the shape of the curve, is exactly the same for every single um, gas that you're going to deal with. Okay, the important thing with this curve is not really to be able to take derivatives and stuff like that, but the important thing is just to understand that at really high distances between atoms, so high volume, low pressure, low moles of gas, you approach ideality. But if you start to lower the volume, raise the pressure, or increase the number of moles, then you have situations where the molecules are closer to one another and you tend to be, get the gas behaving more like a real gas. Okay. So when you have anything out here to the right, that's when you can use the ideal gas equation theoretically. Anything that's to the left of this vertical line, so anywhere it's a real gas, then you're gonna to have to use some other kind of equation of state. In general, one of the things that's used that's pretty simple to use is called the van der Waals equation of state. Another one that's used is the riddlich quang equation of state, and there's also other ones like the virial coefficient uh, expression, all right? And so you just have to look at what kind of molecule you have and system, volume, pressure, moles, temperature, and you decide which equation of state is best for that data because those are empirical and experimental. All right. So hopefully this uh, graph and this talk of potential energy and radius makes sense. And um, then in the next few videos, we're going to go over some equations of state like the ideal gas law and van der Waals equation of state. See you in the next video.